We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Andy. He has 19 years experience in and around the commodities market. And he's joining me today to have a real in-depth discussion around commodities trading, long shorts, all of this type of stuff to really give us a better explanation and understanding of how these markets work. Thanks for joining me today, Andy. Hey, hi, Tom. How are you? I'm excellent. It's great to have you. And I've really enjoyed the conversations that we've had in the past here. Having your experience and and you explaining a lot of these market dynamics a little bit better to me. So why don't we start the conversation by talking a little bit about, let's say, commodity trading, learning some basic terms and really getting an understanding of, let's say, the, the short and longs in commodity trading and the roles of each of those. Okay. I mean, actually, it's uh, commodity is now what everybody is interested in, and it's kind of a revival. And I see that terminologies or other um, aspects are completely uh, misinterpreted sometimes. And I think it's a pretty cool idea uh, to bring this a bit closer to your audience. Actually, I also have like 10 more years in trading cement as well. <laughs> trading cement and shipping Mm -hmm. and i learned very quickly that uh, logistics is actually a very important issue the one part which we should really bring in in onto the focus is that everything is driven by supply and demand which sounds a bit like boring and normal but demand is really triggering everything and every step every change every price every action by people from even on the cash side, on the from the Fed, etc., it's really driven by demand and not by supply, and it's something which we will probably touch every time again. So when I started in eighty seven, eighty eight, I joined Mark Rich in these days, and I learned from really like operation or traffic we called it, and it works like that that. You got the confirmation on a telex from your boss and where he confirmed that he purchased some kind of zinc metal or whatever, or he sold something. And first you had to make sure you had to draft the contract, make sure that you understood what he wanted to have there. And then, of course, in a, in a, in a telex, not everything is in there. If you had a good trader, he, he added quite a, a bit substantially all the items which are important. And then you had to make sure it's signed and you had to line up the hedging when it comes to what material or you have to remind him that we have still to deliver some of these materials in Rotterdam or in some places and shipping needs to be organized. You had to charter a ship, part cargo, etc. So there's a freight desk you have to contact or we had a broker because we were a small department in, the, in these days. There are all these elements and you learn really like a complexity of all things. And a big part is risk, customer risks, pricing risks, because you're working in an environment where the price times the quantity can fluctuate your margin by far. I mean, you're having maybe a 10 box margin or 15 box profit in this whole thing. And the volatility on the commodity is basically like $50, $60 easily, right? So this is like, I remember it, the coal guys, I mean, <laughs> they were making 20 cents a ton or something at best. This was like, that was like normal or like good business, actually. So you can imagine if you have freight costs that emerge, this batch, it, it ruins your complete P&L or in the commodities and the metals. If there is a fluctuation in the price and you didn't hedge properly, that costs a fortune and your P&L is gone. And nobody was really like speculating. This is a complete new invention. I mean, because everybody who took serious positions or speculating, it turned out sour at some point of time, maybe faster or later. Mm-hmm. But nobody survived probably longer than a couple of months if you would really go on a big speculative position. Mm-hmm. So the LME was for me the first touch on this institution where you hedge the metals. And I was in zinc, metal, lead, and tin market at that time. So basically, when you look at, as an example, we took this cable producer, 
he would now be selling his cables or he's offering now for an October delivery because he needs to produce it. And the guy who is buying it is at the moment making his calculation for a building or for the production of cars where he needs these cables. So basically, you're giving him the security of a fixed price. And this is very important. The industry doesn't want to have fluctuations in the price, in the production costs or anything. They want to have it really like stable. And for that, you give him a price, he would accept that. And because you don't know what you're going to deliver in October, uh, respectively, he will have to buy the cathodes for this probably in August to produce the cable. So he will then fix that price, for example, uh, at the LME for August price. And he will do this now at this moment when he commits for his cable delivery. And at that moment, he is long at the LME only. And when people are saying, you are you long or are you short, from a trader perspective, he takes LME simply as a virtual in or out leg mm -hmm. of his trade. He will always look at his own book. He will take what am I at risk versus my physical position and my LME position or COMEX position, whatever. So that's why we got always these ambiguous interpretations. And just to finish a bit uh, the, the LME actions here, if you have now, we are in August, let's say, and he will have to take purchase or have receive his August or, or he needs to purchase his cathodes to produce the cable. He has an open long leg at the LME. And the moment he buys these cathodes from a smelter or from a trader, he will close his LME leg by selling the LME position he purchased. Okay. And at that point of time, you have a difference, it calls a DA, a difference of account, because you bought it in May at the LME and in August, maybe the price is much higher or much lower. So when you're purchasing the cables, the cathodes, you have this physical price, which is then higher or lower than what your cables are supposed to cost on the copper side, because there is some refining, cabling, etc. So there's a, it's a basis, but with other costs added there. But at this point of time, you're having a loss or a profit, which you're matching with your LME action there. And if you look at the smelter on his side, he is buying the concentrates, he's receiving it, he's converting it into cathodes, and there's a big time frame. So the moment when he is buying, he is selling at the LME uh, in forward. So he has a short there, and he is then buying it back when he is selling physically the cathodes to the cable producer. Mm -hmm. So technically, let's say in August, where all these hedges take place, there is no long, no short, and everybody is closing out its position. And when you look at what happened in, in the nickel market, when you see this thing, Sean Holding, when I just read this, I see this is an iron producer, basically, a steel producer, manufacturer, and they need nickel in the steel, in this kind of production. And when they're talking, he has a big short. Of course, he has a big short forward accumulated because he has probably a lot of contracts where he is buying physically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't think he made a speculative short, maybe. Maybe he did. I don't know. We don't mm -hmm. know. But that's not really the point. The point is that if there is no liquidity on the LME and someone forces you to close a position, that's where it gets deregulated, basically. And this is, has to do with the involvement since I learned the business. Uh, we had a different step of changes here coming in. And then the financial institutions, the banks, they took over in volume, basically. When you then look at what is supply and demand, you see that there is a kind of a disconnection because people are now on the paper side much bigger in terms of volume, what's available than actually what's physically going around. And you mm -hmm. see one of the issues in nickel, for example, is these guys, when they buy nickel, uh, they are producing nickel pig iron, basically, which is not like refined cathodes, which are chips which they're using for delivery into the warehouse. So the guy is having physical contracts, but he can actually not deliver them into the LME. So if you have a big short and you cannot buy it back, you could technically deliver it. And he can't. And this is an issue. And that's what we also spoke earlier. You have only accepted brands where you can deliver. Mm -hmm. And 
most of nickel is used in kind of pig iron form, which they are using in these kind of ovens where they burn it together for the steel production, which is much cheaper than using high refined nickel and dilute it basically in the dirt again, right? So the trade or the volumes physically is more nickel pig iron with low, like, 80% content of nickel, for example, and not 99.9 something which they are using for the LME delivery, mm -hmm. which you could use there. So then you got maybe margin calls, and then you're basically forced to close a paper position. And this is the thing. I mean, paper is traded, but physically something different is traded. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like you are forced to buy fuel for your taxi business or something, mm -hmm. which you think like, okay, I'm going to hedge it, but there is no, let's assume there would be no tool to buy fuel for it. So you would say like, okay, the next best thing, which is in the same volatility, more or less, is crude oil or, you know, like with some crude index. And you would basically take the crude index to hedge and hedging is not a perfect match. It's some kind of, you know, like limiting your losses. And you would limit that volatility basically with a byproduct. And in nickel is exactly the same thing with this nickel pig iron and the cathodes. And then also when you're going into nickel business, then looking into what EVs are, they need sulfides and they don't need the nickel as such. So that's another subject we could touch at some point here. So hedging is one very important part. And like I said, people are looking at the fixed the spot prices. And actually, that's not the reality. The reality is always the forward on the curve, forward curve. You have the LME. But initially, LME was supposed to rule or regulate a little bit like the expectancy of when is the coal arriving in London, when they sold the coal, when they imported it from India from or respectively from, uh, from the Far East and, and or tea maybe. You know, they didn't want to have the coal arriving like six ships at the same time. Of course, it could happen. But when they were trading it ahead, the guys could send a telegraph to the loading sites and maybe change and, and load something in India and take tea or curry or whatever, you know, some kind of spices in or coffee or, or some other cargo or cotton, you know, instead. Mm -hmm. So there was a price for the three months which is exactly the time it takes to arrive from Asia back to London. So, you know, that kind of a round trip thing. So then they were exchanging this and this is still what happens. And it's not like the spot price is like at certain level. And then in the future, it's, it's cheaper. Like what we have now, we have most of the commodities we have in the backwardation, which means the forward price is cheaper. It's more like, you expect this is the trade in July or whatever the three-month date is, and then suddenly someone needs the material prompt. Mm -hmm. And then... Andy, that's something I wanted you to touch on as well, is kind of the dynamics of that market in that curve as you're talking about. So explain to us the difference between backwardation and contango. Okay, backwardation is when the future price... I mean, today is a price like, let's say, 1000 bucks for some commodity. Mm -hmm. And for the next month, it's 1,200, 1,400 for the next month and so on. So you have like gaps going upwards. And that would be the contango. The backwardation is it's going downwards. So in other words, the future will be cheaper. So in oil, for example, now the barrel is like 100 bucks for present trades, mm -hmm. which is like COMEX again, which is a bit different. We, we will go to that separation, but let's say that's the spot price. And then five years forward, it's still like 40, 50 bucks. So you can cover that now already. You could make a bet on this. That's one thing. But the expectations that in the future, you will have more supplies available, that's persisting. That's what we think it is. That's an expectation. If you find someone who is committing to you to deliver in five years, fair enough. I mean, that's another risk you're running, all right? I mean, maybe that company is not existing anymore. Who thought that Enron will belly up, you know? I mean, this is another risk you're taking. But what people don't understand really is like that supply and demand is not driven by the spot because everybody is purchasing ahead or is offering prices ahead in the future. 
it only comes to a spot thing if there is no demand, if there is no supply, because demand is suddenly bigger on the spot. No, some people, they can't wait. Uh, something is delayed and then they look for an alternative. I mean, one or two, it works, but then the third and the fourth and the fifth gets squeezed in, you know, and then he's paying up. And then there's a self-regulation. I mean, you can afford to pay up, but at some point you can't anymore. And then demand is eroding because you're not going to pay the triple of the price on your golf sticks or on your bicycle, which you're waiting for three or four months. You want to have it right now. And then you're prepared to an up price. And the same is in the commodities. And commodities is in the basis of everything. But it's not like pure sink. So if you have an up price on a solar panel for a couple of dollars for 60 or for 30 grams of, of silver at some point, it doesn't make them any any big issues. They just pay a little bit more, but the solar panel is 120 bucks or 125 bucks. But it's not like the pure silver, which is suddenly $30, you know, which makes a huge difference on the commodity. And we will see the same things happen in zinc, for example. We have a lot of storage there. The prices are spiking, but production is not curbed on because of this. It's still too low, and the expectations that in the future the zinc price is still low, people will just leave it. But the poor guys who needs the zinc for some purpose, he will have to pay up, pay up, and there is less and less available, so it becomes more and more expensive. And then the incentive at some point is big enough to start production again. Right. So another one of the interesting facts that you told me about is you guys used to talk about money as a commodity. And it was in some ways traded as pallets. So can you share with our listeners that idea and how really the market has been distorted now as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the old days, I learned basically that commodity was ruling everything. So you have like governments, people, you know, presidents or uh, even Merkel, for example, when she traveled. A couple of years back, she was in Egypt and opening ceremony for a gas plant or something. But actually, officially, she was there to make some agreements between some people, you know, refugees, some, some agreements that they can take them back, etc. But quote unquote, it was very funny that, you know, they were, there is a gas supply thing there <laughs> in this country. And some neighbor country needed probably some similar supply, you know, and some country has maybe to finance something. So, you know, this is where suddenly commodities starts ruling the world. Okay. And one of the issues is you need banks to give you credits, etc. And I remember banks, they were just maybe not jealous, but they were not really understanding how this commodity trade is going. And at some point of time, if you're missing liquidity, you were happy that the banks come in and they are promoting a lot. You know, they are promoting like, I mean, suddenly Deutsche Bank was trading coal, for example, or the copper was used from the banking side. And one part of that is actually, we had, I think in the booming days, Copper was traded on paper probably 70 times more than the world needs, actually. Or, I mean, a, a crazy number, right, in terms of volume. And one thing is, when you have a contango, for example, like we said, the price is going up in the future. This is actually based on, I keep the metal ready for you, for the next buyer. I keep it like three months or so, then I'm financing this material. I have to pay for storage and insurance and interest. So that gives a natural contango, which normally would not exceed that parameter. Mm -hmm. But if you are in suddenly working in a field where there is no interest, that becomes an attractive way to park money. And what I learned, like you said, paper, the guys in finance, they were talking a pallet, you know, and I thought like, what the hell are you talking like? No, no, no. It's just like, I think it was a million or 10 millions. I can't remember. I know that today on a pallet, you put a hundred million or physically, mm -hmm. but I don't think we had this kind of volume there. But anyway, it was still a lot of money. They were 
trading and they were changing between bonds, commodities. So if you're a commodity trader and you want to basically finance a position, then the guy in the company would say, no, 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 we have a much better return if we take that money and we put it in bonds or something, you know? So the advantage on money is it's a convertible commodity. It changes. You can change it into coffee, into, into grain, into oil. On the future curve, you can change it into everything. Mm -hmm. Nearby, it's a crazy thing because you cannot print zinc or you cannot print zinc, copper. So it costs so much more to buy it from someone else, which is a kind of bottleneck. But on the forward line, on the, in the future market, you can convert it into anything. And that's the great stuff for money. But now money as a commodity, if you imagine, it's being mined crazy because they're just reproducing it. Mm -hmm. And that has started to distort everything in a way. And then, of course, this whole thing with risk and collaterals. I mean, have you heard about value at risk? It's a kind of a formula which you can calculate that to see how much are you at risk in a commodity business or in a trade, basically. No, I haven't heard about that. It's based on a formula which takes the historical values of a commodity or in these cases. And then let's say at the moment you would have to buy fuel. And let's say the price of the gas station is 120, then it's only 130, 125, 150, 160, 170. At some point, we are at 250, and suddenly we are now, what, 270 in the US or something? 290? I'm not sure. I'm in Canada, and I think we're $1.65 per liter, which is, yeah. I was just in British Columbia, and gas is, let's call it $2 a liter. And then when I came home, it seems nice to only have to pay $1.60, which is yeah. over a dollar per liter more than it was just over a year ago, right? Yeah, exactly. So now on the formula, it will say like, okay, what's the lowest price? And that lowest price has as much influence as the ones in between and the highest one, basically. So and then there's a ratio which is calculated. But now imagine you're in the market. Now we know because we're in the business, we are getting fuel at the fuel station every week, for example. We know exactly this is going up, going up, going up. How big is the chance it's going back to 90 cents or 50 cents, like it was like one year back or, or 60 days back or mm -hmm. whatever? So there's a little chance because somehow you have an expectation. And this is what when you are handing a book, you think like, OK, it's unrealistic that it really goes down. But then they create some crazy you know, indexes or some other mechanism, which because they're just too lazy to understand the business, and then they're evaluating it based on an index thing or on a formula. And based on that, you have to provide collaterals, etc. Or even then you're, you're forced to, you know, that basically they are selling your position, you have to close the position or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And that control, that money is basically has taken over the rational, the physical part. This is crazy in the my view. Mm -hmm. It's distorting a lot. For example, the other thing which I wanted to mention is that you have physical warrants. I mean, you can deliver at the LME. So if you have a short position, you could deliver your cathodes or your sink ingots, etc. And nowadays, this is done in digital form, kind of. I mean, in the past, we had a guy in, in London who had to pull them out from the safe and put it back in the safe, depending on whether you were rolling the position or whether you were just getting the warrants. And on that thing, nowadays you have warrants in Belgium, in Germany, in South Korea, in, in Taiwan. And there are so many other worldwide locations, which we didn't have in the past, really. It's a bit like another funny story that you are going to basically take your long position in warrants, and then you go through the warrants to see where they are. Because obviously, if you can deliver in the Far East, uh, you can save the freight. Mm -hmm. Because if you're shipping around uh, 100 tons of copper, there's still 100 tons of copper. But you have spent money to ship it. Mm -hmm. And there's no revenue to it. This, you know, there's not a premium. Of course, if I'm selling you now a cargo in, in, in another location, I will add a premium to justify my freight. But... If you just take it on a warrant basis, there is nothing. It's just like the settlement price and you bought it at some point and, 
and that's it, you know, then you can see. And there are different qualities as well. So remember the guys who were taking lead, they were looking at lead with very little iron content because the iron is a killer in battery storage and it's very difficult to take out, you know. Or on the copper side, you have bismuth or some other chemical elements which are available or which are allowed to have a certain percentage in the cathodes. But if you are producing copper cables, they break faster, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then every segment, every business is looking at its advantage and the particular um, materials. And now if we look at the difference between LME and COMEX, COMEX, they have also the facility to deliver, okay, physically. Mm -hmm. You can take out, I mean, I'm looking a bit like gold and silver, for example. The thing is, they call this the front month. It's not the spot. It's not like, like if you say spot, then that's the day of the tomorrow on the LME. And that's maybe a huge premium because it's really like short notice. Mm -hmm. And on the comics, they have this front month and they have it now, I think copper is July. Then the next one will be in two months, it's in August. And then just on the last day prior, you can declare that you want to have physical delivery. But if you look at gold and silver, you know, from this rush on the silver deliveries, there are hardly any people allowed to take off there. So it's not really getting a market. And if I listen to the latest from Andrew McGuire, I mean, on the gold side, he says nobody's taking physically is allowed really to take. Nobody's going to sell you physically. Mm -hmm. So this is how they try to prevent it. And there will be a shortage on these metals. And I'm very much convinced. This is actually, you know, how long can you maintain the paper trade versus the physical? And if you can't trade physical anymore, it becomes two different marketplaces. And at some point, the paper marketplace will erode because it's completely disconnected if it disconnects from the physical. And I remember also when we were trading tin, for example, if you had a position you didn't want, and the trader, he didn't want to close or roll the position at the LME, he went on an OTC with a buddy he had in another company to help each other. And they agreed on a premium. And then they just fixed it like settlement today. There's hardly any trade anyway. And then they changed a bigger position, postponed it or something at a premium, which they agreed with. If you would have gone on the market, it would have been much more costly, you know. So that's how they circumvent actually what you see on the screens, mm -hmm. that you basically give a premium. It's like you buy on spot in, in Singapore some gold things, and then they say like, yeah, that's the gold price per ounce plus $300 physical delivery. <laughs> Whatever. Right. Or the COMEX in the days, I remember we had a trader Instead of shipping it to the U.S., he thought, like, I'm taking the stocks from the COMEX. And then they delivered him, like, they, have, they can choose which warehouses. So they're mm -hmm. completely apart everywhere, okay, you know, in the U.S. And then they were limiting the delivery by, I think, two trucks a day or something, which is completely useless if, if you have a bigger volume. So now the, this is regulated, but in the old days, it wasn't. And then, and then you have a physical issue because you have to deliver within a, a certain time period, a certain volume. But, but this was like surprise to them because they didn't want to have the material going out of the warehouse. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something I kind of wanted to touch on as well, Andy, is kind of the difference between commodities and between these exchanges. So, for example, I know... Late last year, there were people talking about there were record low inventories in copper. Like there were only three or four days worth of stocks in the warehouse. But you and I were kind of discussing that that's such a liquid market that that isn't very odd and that that's not really the purpose of the exchange, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're a copper cathode producer, you're in the business for quite a while and you know who are your customers. So if you are going to deliver at some price, at a settlement price or whatever, a current daily price into the LME, that's basically last resort because you're not obtaining any premiums. Mm -hmm. If you have a bigger volume and you're smart enough, the warehouse is paying you something because for the warehouses, it's maybe some business, okay? 
that's what happened as well. They made you make a good deal. That's what you don't. They pay you something because they get the money that from the guy who, you know, when you when you have warrants, you receive the guy who basically when you deliver the warrants to someone, you have to credit him. The, uh, he credits you the storage costs and you credit him the next one. It's like rolling over. Okay, mm-hmm. so it's like a, a differential. You're not making any profit on that. But basically, the, the warehouse for sure gets the rent on that what they have received on warrants. And um, the issue now is for a cattle manufacturer or a zinc producer, it doesn't make any sense really to deliver it into a warehouse. This is like he couldn't sell it to anybody else. Mm-hmm. That's really like the last resort. And it's not a business model. But on the other hand, you cannot have a paper trade without physical delivery. This becomes completely disconnected. So this is actually like the last line of reasonability that, you know, with physically you're picking up something where there is a paper value in the future. And this is just the expectations you are trading. Mm-hmm. And it's a kind of a reality check. And that's why, for example, I think, did we speak around this already about Songxing holding, you know, the nickel squeeze there? A little bit. We kind of touched on it. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, yeah, I mean, this poor guy, he's probably has a physical intake on physical material, but it's not a material he can deliver onto the enemy Mm -hmm. because it's nickel pig iron, 80, whatever, 80% of nickel purity. And for his physical business, he needs that kind of quality. It doesn't make sense that he takes expensive refined cathodes at 99 point whatever percentage to, to put in a smelter then, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. into an iron production. So that's why he could not probably deliver what he physically gets into. But it's different for a cathode producer who, who could then also deliver his brand into one of the warehouses. And now because there are so plenty of warehouses, there are more possibilities actually to deliver them nearby so a minimum of freight is is arising because like we said everything you're shipping around is just double handling costs basically and freight and doesn't add any value on the screen Mm -hmm. okay like that's not a sustainable business but now we see again and this is actually what you can see now they start to put in again into warehouses you can see that copper for example the market the demand is not there Simply not there. It's not yet there. I mean, it will change at some point, I hope, but definitely not now. So in some ways, if we see, let's say, warehouse inventories start to go up, that would be considered an actual negative thing, right? Completely bearish, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there's an oversupply. There's too much supply and the poor guy did not even get a zero premium, not even a disc. I mean, he would have to offer a discount, basically. And then he says, like, oh, I'd rather deliver it to... 15 bucks shipping, and then it's it's in the warehouse, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. So, Andy, when we think about, you know, you and I have spoken a little bit about shipping here, and you were mentioning to me that it, it is in some ways traded like a commodity as well, right? I mean, um, I have to think about it. I think it was in 2000, I was just coming back from Middle East there. Yeah, I think in 2008, nine. Freight has become traded on paper, derivatives, okay? So then I actually, I was basically uh, looking into that trade, trying to develop, actually, actually I developed a model to predict what the Baltic index is going to make in the next couple of days with a very high percentage on uh, success. I think I had more than 87, 80%, actually 85% really. Of over a week or over the two days. And then on the week, it was even above 90%. But freight, they put this on a platform for trading. And this is another funny thing, which is like, you know, you, you can really see that there is no liquidity. You know, you had as a trader, you have to go through these compliance courses that you're not spoofing the market and, and, and what it is and, and how you're, not, you know, like all manipulation things. And when I compare the markets nowadays, I can exactly see the same thing happening there. For example, you want to buy papers. So you put in a bid and you hope that someone is lifting your bid. Yeah, because they used to have other words. Uh, you hit a bit and you lift the offer, basically. You know, it's another thing which, which, which from the metals, it was a bit strange there. But anyway, in these systems, 
you park or you put your bed and then you do the volume. And then people can see that. And you can see that there is not enough volatility or let's say uh, you buy a Panamax paper or a cape, you buy in, uh, in days and you have like days, you buy for a certain month of shipment. And then when you're buying these, immediately the next bit comes up higher and the next one even higher. Mm -hmm. So before you have traded your volume, your price was like increased by crazy numbers. And then you saw like, okay, this is the market. And everybody starts to look at the screen and thinks this is the market. But actually in reality, people who were not so much involved in the paper trade, they hardly looked at it. They were trading, chartering in ships, chartering out others, going in and out. And they're looking at these paper things like, oh, this is crazy. I mean, okay, I could have done another price. So the distortion is, is huge kind of volatility because the participants in that trade on the screen is different to what the physical part is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I look at some market volatility now, I can see that someone has it really under control here. I mean, this is maybe a little bit far-fetched, but I think you could see, for example, in the beginning, you have the, the NASDAQ in the pre-market. Who is trading the pre-market? Foreigners probably and big institutions okay mm -hmm. so then you see the, the nasdaq is giving us some positive feedback it's like showing positive numbers like slightly in the plus and then they hope that the dynamic go further you know mm -hmm. so then other people are coming in saying like, oh nasdaq is up oh, okay and they start buying and then there's a volatility it goes up like this and then suddenly there's a reality check people saying like oh a great opportunity i should actually exit on my positions now finally they start selling and then it drops and this is what we have witnessed before uh, the Fed uh, started to add up on the interest rate. But this is kind of a dynamics which I don't say we tried this on purpose, but we were like sounding out, you know, like you, you're bidding in the small and then when you see it goes up, then you start to sell the big chunk only. You're not going in and say like, oh, I have a big volume and you just sell it. This is only what you see on the gold thing. Mm -hmm. You can see that there suddenly someone is dropping huge number of ounces which is completely unnatural. It's not the normal behavior. Mm -hmm. One of the other topics that we wanted to touch on here, Andy, was the role and the purpose of market makers. Yeah, that's huge, actually. I mean, look, like, like I said, if, if nobody is around and takes your bid and you're supposed to hedge something, it gets completely disconnected because you fix with your customer at a settlement price and hoping that in a couple of minutes or hours before you do the trade on the settlement that you get a better price. But if the settlement is priced there, it's easy, then you can say like, okay, it takes it based on the settlement. But if you have to roll a position, mm -hmm. you know that you're short and you can price it only the next month. So then your position needs to be rolled. To, so you're like what we discussed, your position in August, for example, you have to move it into September or you have to get it down to July. And then maybe you would ask like your video supplier, but if you're in a backwardation and your customer wants to price later, it costs you money. So you have to charge the customer like, okay, I'm delaying, but at a certain price. And that price is what you fix with him. But if then suddenly you want to cover it in the market at the LME and nobody's around, mm -hmm. then crazy thing may happen. Like the guy who has to close the position like on the nickel, and then suddenly you have a hundred thousand. And now this is where this market becomes completely irrational in a way, because someone sold him that number at hundred thousand, and maybe he made a commitment on his other side where he bought it at 90,000 to make a $10,000 difference. And then the LME tells you, no, no, these trades are invalid. How do you justify with your supplier, mm -hmm. you know, where you fix the deal at 90,000? And then you close it in, in the LME at 100,000. I mean, if that happened, then this guy has a problem, you know, because he's, he has a long position at 90,000 and he's so at 100,000, it has been cancelled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we think about these market dislocations, how do you think that, let's take, for example, the gas price in Europe because of the conflict in Ukraine? Do you think that? this has created a, a real distortion in that gas market and that volatility has really been priced into the future delivery of those gas contracts? 
Oh, completely. I mean, but the disruption was there already. Mm -hmm. I mean, gas was supposed to be the transitional, you know, for the green, going for the green. It was supposed to be, let's say, the transitionary energy supply to some extent. And in my view, the actually, if you remember correctly, before the invasion happened, Biden asked Germany, why are you relying on the Russians? Nord Stream 2, okay? And they were saying like, no, 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 we keep this going, etc. And in my view, what's a little bit, what is a possibility there is the inflation issue is a, something which is a very problematic in the US. And one of them is the gas price. Mm -hmm. And everybody will say like, yeah, okay, since we have the new administration in place, oil has gone up because and one, I mean, why was the U.S. Uh, almost actually they were an exporter at some point of time in oil with the shell oil, okay? And by that, they're not really gas consumers. And I think they wanted to push up that production again, but there is no sustainable price to justify the investments. So I think it was a relatively smart idea in a way to say like, okay, we deliver the gas which is being produced by shell gas production, you have also this shell fuel, basically, you have shell gas producing, you have a mm -hmm. bit both of it. You're exporting this to the to Europe instead of from Russia. And with that, you're financing actually a lower price on the oil. And I think this is something which they had in mind and which succeeded because now we, we are completely disrupted from it. But now everybody is expecting that, you know, they're looking at exploring rights again in the North Sea. They're looking at oil being produced, etc. I think it's the wrong way, in a way, because it's a normal reaction because people know there's a lack of energy, fossil energy. They know how to do it. They know how much it will cost and how to do it. But mm -hmm. if you would say like, OK, instead of investing trillions again in the, in the, into the oil or fossil industry, we could spend this into electrification of solar and maybe wind as well to some extent, then people don't know how to distribute it, how to do it, who is going actually to install it. Whereas there are so many good solutions. I, mean, I think you had a, a guest like David Murray, remember, mm -hmm. and he spoke about the thorium reactors which would be a solution, but we are not yet there and nobody mm -hmm. knows how to handle it properly. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue. And, and because of this, because we know how it works and how we can pollute, we, we will probably continue that way, you know, unfortunately. Well, and I think that's a really interesting point and important point because, you know, as these, let's take India, for example, as they come out of you know, the, the uh, come above the poverty line, they tend to burn more fossil fuels as a nation as that population gets basically more and more money, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we want to have this, they, they have a, I mean, they have the right to have the same comfort as we have, right? In a way, why, why should, should they be excluded? But mm -hmm. look, there is always a kind of a protectionism coming in. And this is probably, maybe that's the safe line here or the safeguard line here, mm -hmm. because we don't want to have too much dependency. I mean, now we were exporting the cheap production. I mean, at some point in, in, the, in the 2006 or something, China was converting all the zinc metal concentrates, we shipped them, and then they were exporting the zinc back. And basically the government at some point had to say, no, no, hold on, we are subsidizing with our energy basically the world supply of uh, of commodities okay so they are polluting for us and now we are telling them hey you have to be cleaner so it's really up to us now to produce in europe in the us directly and this is what people are not really also understanding logistics can be longer on distance in a way but it becomes more effective at some point mm -hmm. And I mean, actually, China, Europe, and the US is actually extremes. So if you look at oil on gas production from mainly Middle East, Nigeria, South America, okay, these are like the main source beside Russia now, okay? So what will happen, in my view, is Russia will intensify their pipelines into China, and China is competing with us 
between the freight from the Middle East to China, India, plus what we are in Europe. And we in Europe, we are much closer. So for us, it's probably cheaper. And some of the logistics, we don't have them in place. We don't have the storage, etc. So somehow this logistics will rules or will regulate itself in favor of Europe. And Russia will actually still lose because they have only one customer or two. <laughs> and because of that, they can suppress the price to make the adjustments. But this will be a self-regulated thing there. And then the pollution is some kind of a barrier to stick to the world trade agreements or something in place, right? They could say like, yeah, we are only taking steel, which has been produced green, which is a green steel, which is produced by um, hydrogen or instead of coal, or you cannot leave except vessels um, burning uh, a certain grade of fuels, or you cannot accept certain fuels, etc. So there will be some self-regulatory mechanism to protect yourself. But overall, it's more expensive. I mean, we will lose costs on those. But we will lose it anyway. So either we make the corrections by getting rid of CO2s with penalties or something like that, or whatever the, the system would be, or we gear it up from the beginning and then at some point it becomes cheaper. Mm. It's like uh, solar panels. I mean, you know, there is vanadium, for example. It's a great, you know, you have these vanadium redox, uh, vanadium pentoxide redox flow batteries. They are big, but you can really store for solar collectors from the grid eventually. You can really manage, but there is no more power distribution. And that's an issue. So who is going to earn the money there? So basically, you're tapping everybody or you're stepping everybody on the feet who is in this, in this industry. And then they will say, like, it's not possible, it will not work, and all these things. I mean, of course, in the beginning, there are always teasing issues. There is always an, a problem. But humanity is creative, and they will find a way. So, you know, as we're talking about the pollution and really this green energy future, do you think that the metals are available for the demand that the electric vehicles are going to put on the production of, let's say, copper and nickel, any of the sulfates, all of those different, let's say, commodities that are going to be a necessary part of moving to more EVs, just that piece of the puzzle alone. Do you think that we're going to be able to produce enough metal for that transition? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> but look, if we take the models and we would just say like every car is being substituted by an EV and this is the kind of batteries and this is the kind of model. No, there won't be enough. Mm -hmm. But there are so many alternatives, additional materials. People are talking about zinc air batteries. Okay, we are 10 years away from that yet, but it will come. And the funny thing is, as soon as some metal becomes more expensive or too expensive, then there is a break even of some other rational or some other logic or, or material which comes in. And then it starts to take over at, at that point. So people are creative enough if it's costly enough. OK, yeah. so I think it is a wrong bet at the moment to bet only on the commodities and go into mining and say, like, yeah, there's lithium, etc. So that's another thing which people are not aware of. Battery manufacturers, they're not just taking, for example, uh, nickel metal, they're taking nickel sulfate. So if you're investing into a mine in the, in the view of nickel is required for the batteries in the future, if there is nickel, they will use at the moment nickel sulfide. So you have nickel laterates and sulfides. And this is, you know, like on the mining, it's a difference. And, and not every mine has it. And then what's the location, etc. And then once you're producing something like this, the battery producer, he wants exactly the same quality and steady flow of materials. If it's lithium, not every lithium is suitable for this. So it's like a one-year testing phase until they have really the grade and the things. So that's why maybe a big guy like Tesla, they will think of making their own production. So they can basically bring in any kind of lithium and just process it itself. But then it will affect on the pricing. Now, back to your question about availability. 
Probably not. Probably there will be some metal like cobalt if it's still required. Maybe they can replace it with a different battery system. Maybe, you know, that sort of thing. I'm not enough technicians, but I know there is definitely not enough of that. And uh, neoptium for the, for the magnets is some really, really important thing. There's no better material around. But what's more important is that we create a recycling flow. So basically, when you have a battery which is not working anymore properly, it costs now $30,000 for a battery. And then you have these 30,000 bucks. And basically, it's the commodity that value. So whatever the value on the commodity goes, you bring it back or it's just leased and they take it back and they replace it. So you have a much better recycling process on the batteries. This is what I see in the future. And that's why companies like Neometals or some other guys who are doing recycling things, these, they are really key companies mm -hmm. in the future. So Andy, of course, we're speaking here today on Monday, May 9th. The markets are just going down like crazy. There's seems to be red everywhere. So, you know, in your opinion, is this the start of this system breaking? I think it has already broken because, look, these guys are just talking. I mean, when you look at the replies on the Fed, they are never waiting for a reply or you can ask another second question. And I mean, then interpretation of interpretation. I mean, let's put it that way. Is the fundamentals would be, or is a product being sold? Is there a demand for a product? Or is there a production for that product? What is the S&D? And now you have just on the peak of like all these cycles with cash flows. I mean, we are talking here that cash flows, they're like in a, in a circle, okay? But actually, it's not a real circle because it's not coming to the ending point. It's like a spiral maybe, okay? So this is what we are looking at. And I mean, they are telling you something which they intend to do and just markets are reacting. But it's not the real market. I mean, the guy in China is still producing something or the guy needs to purchase something. He's completely independent of what the stocks are doing. Mm -hmm. The stock value is just a representation of an expectation. But it's, again, this connection. You're trading a Tesla stock, but what is a Tesla stock? Are you buying part of a factory, the know-how, et cetera, and the expectation that this stock is going to have a value? It's almost like the Bitcoin. You are expecting that someone else is paying more or actually it's now it's tanking. So, yes, you could say like, yes, because of the downturn, because of the interest rates, because of the liquidity, like people don't have enough liquidity to purchase or produce something. It has a consequence. But more importantly, people are not going to purchase any more something because of inflation. Mm -hmm. So what will happen, in my view, is inflation. They will have to make a correction because they got under pressure by the stocks because that's what they consider to be natural growth or whatever, economic growth, which has nothing to do, mind you. There's no economic value added if someone trades a stock and sells it at a higher price. What is the economic value added there? It's mm -hmm. nothing. And that's also where I get this funny, funny interpretation of tools. You know, the Fed has tools. They're not producing really something except disasters. Anyway, <laughs> so... So you have this disruption here and on, on, uh, they will probably not make any more hikes at that point of time. But then because the inflation gets further and further, which it will, in, I'm convinced on this, then people are not buying more products, not more consumption. Mm -hmm. It won't improve anything. That's why the Fed is the wrong tool. The Fed is not the tool to improve our economy. Excellent, Andy. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on before we wrap up today? No, I'm fine. I mean, there are so many topics we could touch, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe we get some feedback and you can ask me like, specific questions, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Andy, I, I want to thank you for the, the conversation today and for your time here. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.